Hello everyone, Mr. Linder here. Let's talk about action potentials. So in this video, I want to get into the concept of electrical signaling along the axon of a neuron. Now before we get into that, I want to quickly recap something that was covered in a previous video, which is the idea of graded potentials. Graded potentials have the ability to lead to action potentials. But not all graded potentials will trigger an action potential. So let's look at the idea of two varieties of graded potentials. If a graded potential is hyperpolarizing, so if a graded potential is hyperpolarizing, this is going to be an inhibitory signal. This is actually referred to as an IPSP. IPSP stands for inhibitory postsynaptic potential, inhibitory potential. So if you have an axon terminal connecting, synapsing with a dendrite, you're going to release neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter is going to bind to a receptor. And if you have a hyperpolarizing event, let's say chlorine comes into this dendrite, Chlorine has a negative charge, so it's going to hyperpolarize the postsynaptic cell. This is the postsynaptic neuron of the synapse. This would be the presynaptic neuron of the synapse. If you hyperpolarize the postsynaptic cell, you're getting an inhibitory graded potential. You're actually going farther away from threshold because you're getting more and more negative by adding these negative charges. If it's hyperpolarizing inhibitory postsynaptic potential, you're not going to get an action potential. If you're depolarizing the postsynaptic cell, you can get an action potential if the depolarization is strong enough. These are known as EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. So if you have an axon terminal synapsing with a dendrite, so the axon terminal is releasing neurotransmitter, you're binding to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell, and let's say it allows sodium to come into the cell. That's a positively charged ion that's going to make the, the resting membrane potential more positive. So this is the postsynaptic cell. This is the presynaptic cell. So the postsynaptic cell is becoming more positive. That's an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an excitatory graded potential. And if it's strong enough, to reach threshold, you can open sodium voltage-gated channels. And if you can open sodium voltage-gated channels, you can trigger an action potential. So in previous videos, I showed you how these graded potential signals can move through the cytoplasm, they can spread through the dendrite and cell body, and if they're not strong enough, so if they're sub-threshold at the axon hillock, you would not get an action potential. There's no action potential if you're sub-threshold because you're not opening the sodium voltage-gated channels. But if you are above threshold, what we call supra threshold, then you can open sodium voltage gated channels because you're at the threshold value, negative 55 millivolts or more positive. And so you would trigger an action potential. Now, how come the action potential doesn't happen along the dendrites and the cell bodies? Well, that's because the sodium voltage-gated channels are located along the axon. So action potentials are going to happen along the axon of the cell because that's where you find the sodium voltage-gated channels. 
So a graded potential that is excitatory, an EPSP that is supra threshold, can trigger action potentials along the axon of a neuron. So what is an action potential? An action potential really is electrical signals created along the axon. And those electrical signals are conducted, they're moved all the way down to the axon terminal. It turns out that it's not just one action potential that occurs along an axon. It's actually multiple action potentials that occur along the axon and make their way all the way down to the axon terminal. Think of it like the domino effect. So if a graded potential, an excitatory, an EPSP, makes its way to the axon hillock and it's at threshold or above, negative 55 millivolts or more positive, you can open these sodium voltage gated channels and allow sodium to enter into the axon. And that's the beginning of an action potential. But that's just the first action potential. So these dominoes represent the action potentials. So if this is an axon, then this first domino is really action potential number one. It's the first electrical event that happens at the axon hillock. And once you trigger the first action potential, you can trigger the second action potential, action potential number two, which is farther down the axon. The first domino, after you hit the first domino, that first domino is going to then hit the second domino. And the second domino is going to hit the third domino. And so now you can have action potential number three, and so forth and so forth. So this domino effect is what you're seeing along the axon. You open the first sodium voltage gated channel because you reach threshold and the opening of that first sodium voltage gated channel is going to allow sodium to come in which is an excitatory depolarization along the axon which is then going to affect the next sodium voltage gated channel which is going to allow sodium to come into the cell. And that's going to affect the next area and the next area and the next area. And so what's happening is you're conducting the action potential down the axon. What you see here is a positive feedback loop, and we'll come back to this concept later, but this is a positive feedback loop. If you trigger the first action potential, you can then trigger the next one, the next one, the next one, and the next one. And so you are amplifying the situation. You have this positive feedback that is taking place. This allows for the action potential signal to make its way all the way down to the axon terminal without losing strength. Turns out action potentials are these all or none events. You either get an action potential or you don't get an action potential. So once you are uh, supra threshold with a graded potential, and once you trigger the opening of the first set of sodium voltage gated channels, you are going to get an action potential. So if you are supra threshold, you get everything. It's an all event. If you're sub-threshold, you're going to get nothing. Nothing's going to happen along the axon if you're sub-threshold. So if you have a graded potential that only gets to negative 60 millivolts, you're not going to get a partial action potential. You're going to get nothing. You have to be at negative 55 millivolts or more positive in order to trigger an action potential. So action potentials are all or none events. So if you look at this diagram, you'll notice that a weak signal, which is sub-threshold, gives you no action potential. It's a none event, nothing happened. There's no action potential being recorded on this graph. But if you get a signal that is supra, threshold, you do get an action potential. That's the all event, right? This is the all effect. You get an action potential. 
Notice though that if we increase the strength of the stimulus, notice that the amplitude of the action potentials are the same. So relatively speaking, all action potentials look the same. So they either happen or they don't happen, and they all have about the same strength. So action potentials don't lose their strength with distance. All action potentials look the same or roughly have the same amplitude. That is different than what you see with graded potentials. Graded potentials get weaker with distance, but action potentials do not. Action potentials maintain their strength along the axon, and they actually all look relatively the same. If the action potentials all relatively look the same, how then do you interpret action potential signals? How would the brain code for intensity of a stimulus if this stimulus, this stimulus, and this stimulus Notice they're getting larger with strength, right? Each stimulus is bigger than the next, and yet the action potentials look the same. How does the brain then code for those electrical signals? Well, it turns out that we are not amplitude modulated. In fact, we rely on frequency modulation rather than amplitude modulation. So, the frequency of action potentials is going to determine the strength of the stimulus, not the amplitude. So let's take a look at this diagram. In the first situation, we have a stimulus that is sub-threshold. If a stimulus is sub-threshold, we've learned that there's no action potentials. So clearly the brain isn't going to receive a signal, it's not going to interpret anything uh, because there was no electrical signal going to the brain. Uh, think of the concept of perhaps bacteria on your skin. Bacteria on your skin is not um, mechanically distorting receptors in your skin to the point where they can create graded potentials that are going to be above threshold. Graded potential signals are going to be sub-threshold, therefore there's no signals uh, making their way to the brain. There's no interpretation uh, of the touch of bacteria on your skin. You don't notice that they're there. Let's say though that there's a stimulus okay, that is supra-threshold. But maybe it's not a very strong uh, graded potential. Okay? So it's a weaker stimulus, but it's still super threshold. You're able to activate uh, receptors in the skin. Maybe it's light touch on your skin. Okay, so light touch. And it's activating receptors in your skin. It's creating excitatory signals and it's triggering action potentials along sensory neurons. But because it's a, uh, a weak stimulus, the action potential frequency is slow. So these are action potential signals traveling along the sensory neurons, but notice that they're spread out. So it's a slow frequency of signal going to the brain. And so your brain is interpreting this slow frequency as light touch. But let's say you press hard on your skin. So there's a lot of pressure, right? Let's say there's some hard pressure on your skin. It's a stronger stimulus. If you push hard on your skin, that's going to increase the action potential frequency. You're going to cause the sodium voltage-gated channels to open more frequently, and you're going to increase the action potential frequency. So this is a fast action potential frequency. Notice the action potentials are closer together. 
And so your brain is going to receive that fast action potential signal, and it's going to interpret it as a hard pressure. So we are not amplitude modulated, because notice the height here of the action potentials are the same, but we are frequency modulated. So we rely on FM rather than AM interpretation uh, to code for stimulus intensity. Now there is another way to code for intensity, and it's something called recruitment. In recruitment, we can use stronger stimuli to activate axons in a nerve that have higher thresholds. So that's introducing a concept that is a little bit different. When you take a look at, this is now not a single neuron, this is actually representing a nerve. Nerves are actually bundles of neurons. So there's lots of neurons running through the nerve. So let's say each line here represents a neuron running through the nerve. And we said that neurons have a threshold value. Turns out though that different uh, neurons can have different threshold values. So let's say some of these have negative 55 millivolts as their threshold, but some of these other neurons have a higher threshold. Maybe they're set at negative 45 millivolts. So a weak stimulus is only going to activate, let's say, the negative 55 thresholds because it's not going to get to the negative 45. But a strong stimulus is going to activate all of the neurons that run through this nerve because it's able to get to the threshold value of some of those neurons. So this is introducing a concept where not all neurons will actually have the same threshold. We typically introduce the idea of threshold as negative 55 millivolts or more positive, and it, it's made to seem like all neurons have the same threshold, but it turns out that within a nerve, some neurons can be set at higher thresholds. And so when you have higher threshold neurons, you can recruit them, you can activate them, if you have stronger stimuli. So weak stimuli will only activate some cells within the nerve, but stronger stimuli will activate more cells within the nerve. So a weak stimulus only activates a few axons, while a strong stimulus will activate lots of axons within a particular nerve, and that's known as recruitment. So your brain can rely on frequency of signaling and also rely on recruitment to determine uh, intensity of signaling. So now that we have some background information on action potentials, we can move on to what does the electrical signal actually look like? What is this action potential signal and what does it actually look like? So in this diagram, this is just showing you frequency again, uh, but this is showing you how you can have a weak stimulus and a slow frequency, and you can have a strong stimulus, and you can have a fast frequency. So just another example uh, of what uh, that FM modulation would look like as you interpret what's happening in the brain. So this is an action potential uh, diagram. So let's get back to the idea of what is an action potential. An action potential really is just an electrical event. It's an electrical event. It's, it's not a structure on the axon. It's not a physical structure. You know, when we look at an axon, a physical structure would be the sodium voltage gated channel. Um, a physical structure would be the potassium voltage gated channel. Okay? A physical structure would be the sodium potassium pump. But the action potential is not a structure you can point to. The action potential is the changes in the voltage across the membrane. It's an electrical event. 
<clears throat> so when we change resting membrane potential, okay, because the neuron is at rest, it sits at negative 70 millivolts. And when you change that, you can have these electrical events. And so we can have graded potentials and we can have action potentials, these electrical events that happen along a neuron. So the action potential is this electrical event that's taking place along the axon. And it's the result of opening uh, sodium voltage gated channels. That's the start of the action potential. When you look at an action potential, we have the idea of a resting phase. So we have resting membrane potential. And then we have the rising phase. This would be essentially the depolarization phase uh, of the action potential. And we have the falling phase. This would be the repolarization uh, of the action potential. And then we have the hyperpolarization phase where we actually go below uh, resting membrane potential for a certain amount of time. So if you follow the dashed line here, we're dropping below resting membrane potential. And then you'll notice that we eventually get back to resting membrane potential. So we get back to this rest phase. So an action potential is just really this change in voltage where we depolarize, we go in a more positive direction, we repolarize, we go in a negative direction, we go below resting membrane potential, hyperpolarization, and then we reset back to resting membrane potential. And that really is an action potential. And again, action potentials happen at one location along the axon. So in order to move the electrical signal, you have to create a second action potential, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and so forth. The action potential right, is created because graded potentials can bring you to threshold. So what are the events of this action potential? If you were to look at the events of the action potential, you could almost number what's taking place uh, in this electrical event. And if we had a voltmeter set up along the axon, so here we have our voltmeter and it's set up along the axon, you could measure the changes that are taking place as you have an action potential. So what you're seeing here, this electrical event represents the action potential. Starting at resting membrane potential, and then going more positive, and then going back to more negative, that is an action potential. So if we were to look at the numbers and sort of give it uh, these steps, what is an action potential? So let's go through the steps then of an action potential. So the first thing, number one, is the neuron begins at resting membrane potential. So the neuron starts at negative 70 millivolts. Number two, a graded potential needs to come and bring the neuron to threshold. We need to bring the axon hillock to threshold. So we need a graded potential that's going to depolarize the neuron, depolarize the cell to negative 55 millivolts or more positive in order to trigger an action potential. If the graded potential is super threshold, if it's above threshold, then, and notice the threshold line is indicated here for you. If it's above threshold, then you can trigger the action potential. How do we trigger the action potential? Number three, sodium voltage gated channels open. So if sodium voltage gated channels open along the axon hillock, then you have the beginnings of the action potential. And again, it's an all or none event. So if you hit threshold and you open sodium voltage gated channels, you are going to get this electrical event taking place. You're going to have an action potential. So what happens when you open sodium voltage gated channels? Well, number four, sodium ions are gonna flow into uh, the axon. So sodium follows its concentration gradient it flows through the sodium voltage gated channel and you get a depolarization spike. And this depolarization, it takes us in a positive direction. Once you bring in, so getting back to this idea of conduction, 
once you open that first sodium voltage gated channel, once that sodium comes into the axon, if this is your axon, that sodium is then going to diffuse to the next area of the axon. And that's going to lead to this positive feedback event that's going to trigger the next action potential and the next one and the next one. Number five, sodium voltage gated channels are gonna be open for about a millisecond and then they're going to inactivate. Once they inactivate, they're not going to be able to allow sodium to enter the cell anymore. But as the sodium voltage gated channels are inactivating, the potassium voltage gated channels are going to start opening. So as you reduce, let's go back here, as you reduce the, the movement of sodium into, as you reduce the movement of sodium into the axon, you're going to start increasing the movement of potassium out of the axon. So if we go back to our axon, the sodium voltage gated channels have now become inactivated. So there's a block that's taking place. So sodium cannot enter into the axon anymore, but now potassium voltage gated channels are opening. And so potassium can start leaving the axon. So this is a potassium voltage gated channel. And as potassium begins to leave the axon, you begin to see the repolarization and eventually hyperpolarization that's going to take place. Repolarization and hyperpolarization. So the movement of positive ions out of the cell, if we take a look at number six here, as the potassium voltage gated channels are open and potassium is flowing out of the axon, you're getting a repolarization. And this actually represents a negative feedback event. We had the depolarization that took place, and now we're having the repolarization. We're bringing us back to where we started, and so that's a negative feedback event. So you can see both positive feedback and negative feedback taking place in this idea of an action potential. The positive feedback is for conduction, moving the signal down the axon. The negative feedback is for resetting this area of membrane. Right? To reset the membrane so you can use it again, we need to repolarize and reset back to resting membrane potential. So potassium, if we look at number seven, potassium voltage gated channels are open for two milliseconds. They're actually open longer than the sodium ones. And this is why you get this hyperpolarization that takes place. If the potassium channels are open longer, that means potassium is flowing out and making the inside of the cell more negative than regular resting membrane potential. And so if we're more negative, okay, we're going below resting membrane potential, we call that a hyperpolarization. Eventually, the potassium voltage gated channels close. So we see number eight here, potassium voltage gated channels are closing. There's less now movement of potassium. We see a decrease in the potassium flow, the, the potassium conductance. And then lastly, number nine is that the sodium potassium pumps are always running to maintain resting membrane potential. You don't need sodium potassium pumps to have an action potential. Action potentials happen right, because of the sodium voltage gated channels and the potassium voltage gated channels. You get a depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization because of sodium and potassium voltage gated channels. But I like to throw in the idea that sodium potassium pumps are always running to maintain the separation of charge across the plasma membrane of the neuron. And that's going to help us get back to the negative 70 millivolts for resting membrane potential. But you don't need sodium potassium pumps for an action potential. 
but I like to include it. So we'll call it number nine. Following hyperpolarization, you are going to see sodium, potassium pumps moving sodium and potassium across the membrane so that you can maintain the concentration differences and quickly correct us back to resting membrane potential. But a sodium potassium pump is not necessary for an action potential. In fact, you can have hundreds, if not thousands of action potentials before you actually threw off concentration gradients. It would take a lot of action potentials to significantly change concentration gradients. But we need sodium potassium pumps to maintain resting membrane potential for the duration uh, of your uh, lifetime of your neurons. So we put them in as part of the ending of an action potential. Now action potentials have something called refractory periods. The absolute and the relative refractory periods. Refractory periods essentially represent uh, points in time where you may or may not be able to get action potentials. Now they're only milliseconds uh, events. Remember an action potential is only a few milliseconds. If you actually look at the timing here, where it says zero to one to two to three. This is milliseconds of time. So action potentials happen as far as we're concerned as humans in you know, an instant. Okay? Milliseconds of time is extremely fast. So these refractory periods also happen in milliseconds of time. So we don't necessarily recognize that they're taking place, but they do occur and they are important. So what are refractory periods? <clears throat> refractory periods are when you may or may not get an action potential. The first one called the absolute refractory period is when you absolutely cannot have an action potential. Absolute is saying that you can't get an action potential to occur. Basically, you can't overlap action potentials along um, an axon. So if you're looking at an axon, we cannot overlap action potentials. We can't have action potential number one and then have another action potential, action potential two, overlapping that one. And the reason you can't do that is because of the absolute refractory period. You can't start another action potential or have a second action potential on top of another one because sodium voltage-gated channels become inactive. So if you look at this diagram, you'll notice the ball and chain structure on these sodium voltage gated channels. They've inserted themselves into uh, the opening of the channel. So sodium can no longer enter into the axon. And if sodium can't enter into the axon, you can't depolarize and therefore you can't trigger another action potential. So the absolute refractory period prevents the overlapping of action potentials. And it's because the sodium voltage gated channels become inactive. You have to allow the membrane to reset itself before you start another action potential. So if you have a graded potential that triggers the first action potential, action potential number one has to resolve. It has to happen. And then we have to start to reset before another graded potential can come along and start another action potential sequence along the axon. And this happens because of the absolute refractory period. The relative refractory period is when you're in the hyperpolarized state. When you are hyperpolarized, you are farther from threshold. Farther from threshold. So if you're farther from threshold, it's going to take a stronger stimulus to get you up to that threshold value. Notice on the diagram back here, if you're at resting membrane potential, right, there's only a small gap that you have to overcome. And here you have a larger gap to overcome when you're hyperpolarized. And so it's going to take stronger stimuli to get you to threshold. And so the relative refractory period says that you can get another action potential if you can overcome the hyperpolarized state. If you can't overcome the hyperpolarization, you have to wait 
to get back to resting membrane potential before the next graded potential can get you to threshold. So relative refractory means that you could get another action potential, but it's relative. It's relative to the strength of the graded potential. Strong graded potentials can overcome the hyperpolarized state and trigger an action potential, but weak graded potentials cannot. And so this brings us to this idea of that slow and fast frequency. This is why you have slow frequencies with weak stimuli because the graded potentials are not strong enough, right? They're not strong enough to overcome, they're not strong enough to overcome that hyperpolarized state. A strong stimulus can have fast, a strong stimulus can have fast frequencies because the graded potentials are strong enough, right? They are strong enough to overcome the hyperpolarization. And so what happens is before the axon can go all the way back to resting membrane potential, when you have a strong graded potential, you can start triggering that next action potential sooner. So here we get an action potential that's taking place during the relative refractory period because the graded potential is strong enough to overcome the hyperpolarized state. So action potentials don't overlap themselves in the absolute refractory period, but you can start to overlap during the relative refractory period as long as you have strong enough graded potentials. So refractory periods are going to limit your frequency. They're going to determine how fast or how slow the signaling actually is. Next time we'll pick up with conduction and then we'll get into other factors that affect action potentials. I hope this helps. Take care.